I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the National Academy to our event this afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Ada, and I'm the director of the Water Science and Technology Board here at the Academy. And it's a real pleasure for us to have the chance to host you all here, working together with the AGU and specifically the hydrology section. It's been uh, enjoyable for us to um, envision what this, this event would look like, and, and it's been a, a real treat to work with the folks that, uh, through the AGU um, and, and our staff team here. Uh, we have a wonderful set of panelists this afternoon going to look at this uh, important issue of water science and how it informs and supports uh, policy and decision making. And hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to end too for a lot of uh, discussion with all of you from the audience. So, do line up your questions and, and get those ready. I have a couple of housekeeping announcements before I turn the floor over to other folks here. Um, the first one is that after the event closes today at, at 5, uh, we will have a reception here, and that will be off to my right, uh, just in the corner in this room, and you're all welcome to join us for that reception. That will last for an hour, uh, so from 5 to 6 p.m., and hopefully you'll be able to carry the conversations further along with, with that. Um, just from, again, from a housekeeping point of view, there are restrooms off to my left, uh, diagonally in that direction between the two exit signs will be over there, so uh, please avail yourself of, of those, yourselves of those if needed. And finally, in, in regards to any, um, any fire alarms that you sound, you're our guests here. We want to make sure you all are safe while you're in our house. And so if an alarm should sound, don't pay attention to the exit signs that are above you right here. Uh, because <laughs> those particular doors are actually locked for <laughs> security purposes. However, the door, the door through which you came in, off to my right, um, immediately outside of that door, literally about five feet to the right through that door, is a fire exit that you may use. So please, uh, if an alarm should sound, just gather your small things with you, exit through that door. Our muster point um, is the National Building Museum. It's on the corner of 5th and F Streets. It's a gigantic red brick building. You can't miss it. Um, so we would gather there on the lawn until the security folks would allow us back into the building. Um, and with that said, what I'd like to do is turn the floor over to Scott Tyler to uh, get, uh, welcome you uh, on behalf of, of the AGU. So Scott, please. Well, thank you very much for coming. On behalf of the American Geophysical Union and the hydrology section of the uh, American Geophysical Union, I do want to welcome all of you. Um, to this event. There are a few topics uh, in the world, I think in our world of earth sciences, that lend themselves better to the dealing of the, the interaction between science, engineering, and policy, and uh, as water does. So it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity here to talk about how we can, how the AGU and our American Geophysical Union can inject our, our science and get it out, get the message out. Just as an anecdote, I just came over, literally rushed over from our invited lecture uh, for our session, for our section at the, at the meeting over in the convention center. And at the end of this lecture, one of our researchers, one of our young researchers, put this slide up that says, "Well, here's what's proposed for the changes in the uh, the Clean Water Act and and, and uh, uh, maintaining water quality in upper catchments. And here's what the cost will be. Here's what the cost is, or the value in dollars of what those upper catchments and wetlands are." as far as the cost of water treatment. So directly transferring science into dollars, which I think usually means policy, from what I understand. So um, it is my pleasure uh, to, to be here, and, uh, and I really appreciate the National Academy and, and the American Geophysical Union working together on this uh, for the future. Uh, this is a, an inaugural event. We propose to, to take the information from this, uh, from this panel, use it through the year, uh, our technical committee in water and policy in the, in the section will be working on this over the year, and then we hope to run something again similar to this um, in, at the San Francisco meeting in, uh, in 2019. So to that end, we are recording the event today uh, so that we can capture all the, all the input that we get. These things don't happen without the hard work of a few people, and those few people happen to be, in our case, our early career scientists at the American Geophysical Union's hydrology section. And that's a group, again, a technical committee called the Water and Policy uh, Group. And uh, it's been amazing to work with these, in this case, three uh, individuals. Sarah Freeman, who's a PhD student at uh, the University of Massachusetts. Ethan Yang, who's a, 
assistant professor at Lehigh University, and Julie Bono, who is at the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research. These folks put tireless amounts of time and energy into this. This is their show, and it is a, a real pleasure and honor uh, to be uh, a little bit a part of it. You're going to hear from Ethan uh, at the end of the presentation, but for now, I'm going to introduce Sarah Freeman from the University of Massachusetts to introduce our panel and get things started. So thank you. And welcome. Thank you, Scott, and thanks everyone for coming out. We're very excited for this. Um, planning started about a year ago in New Orleans. Um, but before getting into the panel, I actually wanted to start with um, a bit of a personal story um, about sort of my my journey, I guess, to this question of science in in policy and decision making, which started 12 years ago when I was finishing up undergrad and found myself in a tiny community called El Cristal in Ecuador. Um, and I spent about a month there taking surveys of um, different households, asking them about their concerns about their health, um, and then basically mucking around with a man named Jose who had no teeth and a machete, um, trying to take water quality samples of their water supply system. Um, and you know, we came out of that experience, first of all, finding out that about 80% of the community had diarrhea, um, which no one actually wanted to talk about with each other. And we also were able to identify areas within their water supply system where the contamination was coming from. And as also a young, eager engineer, I said, this is great, it means I have a design problem and I can build something. Um, in the meantime, we also communicated these results. We wrote them down. We distributed them to three different leaders within that community. And within about three months' time, we were in contact with them, and they said, yeah, it's wonderful. We've actually taken this to our local government. Within three months after that, they said, yeah, we demanded so much that the government actually came in and provided us with a uh, you know, treatment system. And I think at the time it was interesting because we said, oh, we don't get to design this thing. But then we also you know, were reflecting on the fact that with this credible information in the right hands of the right individuals, you know, it's just amazing uh, sort of transformational change can happen. Um, and that was a very powerful moment. Um, in terms of understanding what the, the power of the right information can do. And it was also a lesson in how to connect the real demand for that information with the supply. Um, and that is kind of the idea for the session. You know, we're at ATU, so wanting to see how can we connect um, the supply of information and research with the demand <laughs> from a really amazing group of panelists that uh, span a very diverse types of decision making across different scales. Um, and um, I want to, before I turn it over to our moderator, also introduce uh, Ingrid Timbo, who's in the audience, uh, who is also with the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. She is our rapporteur for the session, um, so she'll be taking notes and trying to consolidate lessons learned. And then um, of course, John Matthews, who is also the um, co-founder or the founder and coordinator for the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, um, who has for very many years um, been instrumental in bridging science and policy communities. Um, I could tell you, I've known him for a very long time, so I could tell you a lot more stories about him, but that those would have to wait for the uh, reception afterwards. Um, but I really, I leave you guys in very wonderful and able hands. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, and I'm really honored uh, to be here uh, uh, with the panel. I, uh, some of you I've known for uh, quite a long time, and uh, a few of you are, are new. And uh, it's also nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience, and also so many unfamiliar faces, actually. Uh, I'm curious, uh, it, it, the people that are here, um, how many of you would describe yourselves as for an early career? <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> that, that's probably 80% uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the audience here. Uh, how many of you are working in uh, uh, already with uh, uh, or distributing some 
uh, water right now. <laughs> 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 water allocation problem. <laughs> 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 How many of you uh, are uh, actually working on all the related issues right now? That's probably about half of the people who raised their hand before. Uh, how many of you are, are engaging directly with policymakers? Uh, uh, a little bit smaller group, but, but not, not much. That, that's really interesting. And uh, what about uh, uh, hydrology? How many are involved in uh, hydrology? Most of you. Wow. Uh, uh, engineering? <laughs> <laughs> biology. Uh, a few tokens on biology. So. Um, and uh, uh, what about uh, 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 any of the social sciences? Okay, good. Yeah, I'll <clears throat> raise my hand on that one too. That's an interesting mix. Um, my, my own uh, personal story actually uh, I came from publishing. Uh, I, I uh, worked in publishing for about 12 years as a book editor, and, and I, I loved publishing. Uh, I was in the New York publishing world, and I made a transition where I I, I, I got jealous of my author. And, and uh, I, I thought they were doing more interesting work and more relevant work, and I wanted to be uh, uh, more like them. And I ended up uh, deciding to, to get a PhD in biology, working in, in, uh, in ecology. Um, uh, at, at this point, uh, a lot of our work in Agua uh, relates to uh, uh, both decision making uh, at, a, at an institutional level, but at least uh, Ingrid and I just come from the top too, in Poland. Uh, and it's really interesting to see at that level how uh, decisions around science and policy are, are sometimes talking with each other, sometimes talking past each other. And uh, and it, it can be really dramatic. There was a panel that I was uh, moderating just about a week ago. It's a very famous uh, biologist who's uh, in a UN session. She was talking about this, uh, what I will just loosely describe as this important uh, forest uh, and, and river ecosystem in the tropics. Uh, she, she's well known. She's published in, in, a, in a lot of uh, major uh, papers. <coughs> and she was talking uh, to a large group. Uh, heads of UN agencies were in the room. Uh, 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 active negotiators were in the room. She was talking about uh, how this system is flipping uh, in real time from being a carbon sink to carbon store. Uh, and as a mixture of land use change uh, and, uh, and climate impact. And it's a, it's, a, it's a really powerful story, it's a really disturbing story. And, and she, it's not, it's not uh, even in the unit triple C, not one that's really well understood. Uh, and some of the people uh, in the audience in the group were very agitated by it. And there was one woman, I think she was uh, she's actually a negotiator. She raised her hand and she said, what should we do? That was a really important moment. That was a signal moment. So she should have had an answer for it, uh, I think. She, her answer was, uh, to me at least, was very satisfying. She said, we need we need more money for monitoring. <laughs> we, we, we do, <laughs> but, it, but it, it, it's not necessarily like a, a clear answer that makes sense in the context of the and, and, and I would argue that we should probably all be ready for that question. Uh, what, what should we do? Uh, and I think that's the question that we're going to be trying to look for uh, this afternoon. So uh, with that, the structure that we're going to go, uh, uh, we're going to have each uh, of the speakers uh, give something like a seven or eight minute uh, intervention, a little personal story, a uh, sense of, of where they see this issue uh, in, in their own lives, the, their own reflection. Uh, uh, there's no slides. Uh, if we, if we uh, go a little literally, then there's more time for questions. Uh, otherwise, questions will be, uh, will be asked. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, Aaron Goldberg. I, if you don't know him, Aaron is uh, the, I, he works at the U.S. State Department. He manages the development and implementation, U.S. foreign policy and drinking water sanitation, water resources management, and transboundary uh, water and fuel ocean environment and science. Uh, he's also been published in Lambert. I know you 
actually remember that? Which again, for the scientists, has a much greater readership than science and DNA. Keep in count. So that I, he left that off of his bio, but I knew. <laughs> All right, so uh, Eric. Uh, hopefully, that's not my only thing. <laughs> Uh, and, and to be frank, I expected it to go last. You're the policy guy that really always goes last. Aaron, hang on, let's get there where I want to get your microphone. This work? Did this work? Can you hear me? Okay, the microphone isn't helping. How about that? No, it's still there. Okay, that yeah, that works. Okay. And, and do I need it? Yeah. There's, yeah, there's, there's, uh, we have people who are joining us remotely. Ah, okay. Uh, well, well, John, thank you very much. And, and usually I go last, uh, and so by that point, then the entire. So I try to keep my remarks short. I'm only going to make a couple of points. Uh, so hopefully it'll be a little bit different than what you hear from, from some of the others. But but first, uh, you know, as John mentioned, uh, so I manage U.S. foreign policy uh, on the entire range of water issues. Drinking water sanitation, water resource management, and transboundary water and conservation. Uh, so, this is a Sorry, Yeah, you have to actually. Sorry, I have to actually hold it up. Yeah. Uh, and so, this includes anything that you can imagine <coughs> water, uh, everything from taps and toilets all the way through to water and energy, water and food, dams, pollution, navigation, climate, you get it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and there are really three parts to the job. Um, the first is, is trying to strengthen the United States government's own capacity to respond to international water challenges. Uh, and, so, and you can imagine it's a difficult thing. There's more than 20 different agencies uh, that work on international waters, water issues across the United States government. There's some people in the room who come from some of those agencies. Um, I'm actually very lucky to manage an interagency water uh, working group that includes representatives from all these different agencies. And they're really the brains. They're the ones who, in fact, over 20 years have really mentored me on the issues of water and taught me about water. I am not like you. I don't have a background in water. I have never taken a class, a course, or anything ever on water. Uh, and, and some of my mentors are actually in the room, uh, but people I've learned, uh, learned about uh, water from. But it's really this interagency water working group that helped us better understand what the United States government's position should be on issues like dams, on the human right to water, on privatization, on hype. Oh, please do not raise that. <laughs> um, uh, and on, on international issues like uh, uh, water and sanitation and things like that. Uh, and in fact, the key outcome of this process has been the World Water Strategy. Have any of you seen this? I brought a copy with me in case you haven't. Uh, the U.S. Global Water Strategy, this was put out last November. Um, and, uh, you know, I won't say it's a perfect product, but it's not a bad product in terms of framing how the United States government is going to try to tackle these challenges. I think what I am most proud about is, is this, that there are, there are implementation plans from 16, 17 odd different agencies on how the U.S. government agency can contribute to implementing this strategy. And that really is a, a major step forward in how we need U.S. government work together to address these issues. Looking at Raha here from USDA, who's actually a key part of, of building uh, elements of the strategy and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of an example of one part of what we need to strengthen uh, what the United States government does, uh, developing policies on these complicated issues. That's another part of what we that we try to do to strengthen uh, the work the United States does, and trying to coordinate among the different agencies on the implementation of that strategy is part of what we do to strengthen the U.S. government. Um, the second thing that we do is, is we try to strengthen the way the international community works. And you can imagine, I mean, it's a very complicated space, excuse me, complicated space. Uh, we have the UN system, and uh, there's well over 20 different UN agencies uh, that have some connection to water, some way, shape, or form. International financial institutions, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, uh, international organizations, the uh, Union, ASEAN, APEC, uh, OECD, OSC, you know, a huge long list of acronyms that they've through. But, and, and then there's international partnerships um, that are now coming together to work on these types of issues. So if you had, if you're the United States, how do you structure that? Now, what should the role of these different institutions be? How should they approach water? What should their goals and objectives be? What kind of support do you give them? How does it all work together in a coordinated way to solve the world's water challenges? So that's the second thing uh, that we try to do. And then the third thing that we do is we do have some projects and programs. Um, we are not a development agency. We're not the USAID. We're not the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, but so our funds are very 
very, very modest. Um, what we try to focus on is on catalyzing change, on bringing attention to issues uh, that are being addressed internationally, uh, but are important to the United States, but might not be getting the kind of attention that we think that we need, or supporting cooperation on transboundary water issues. We spend a lot of our time working to prevent conflict on transboundary water issues. Those are issues that really get the attention of the Secretary of State. They, they usually walk down and say, oh, country X is threatening country Y, go in and fix that. Uh, and that's when, we're, that's when we'll spend a lot of our time and a lot of our diplomatic effort. Hopefully, you don't hear much about our interventions, because these are really problems that countries themselves need to solve. We can talk more about that if that's something that you want to do. But that's the third area that we work on in some of these projects in the program. Um, so, where does the science and policy connect? And these guys are going to talk a lot about that, but I wanted to try to uh, throw out two points that might not come up in their discussions. I'm going to take a slightly different <coughs> angle at it. Um, the first is, and actually it was alluded to it at the very beginning, and that is good science, good economic analysis um, can create the political will to act. Uh, and that's critically important for my I mean, How do I convince people? How do I convince government to act and take action? Can you define the problem? Can you assess the impact of the problem? How much will that impact our strategic interests? Are there national interests of the United States government or the interests of other partners in the region? Can the problem be fixed? And if it can be fixed, how much will that fixed cost? And who should do that? You know, these are all questions that if you've got good answers to, like John was saying, and somebody said, what do you do? If you've got good answers to, you can change the way people behave. You can change, you really can. You really can change the way the world works. Uh, and if you've got it, science can drive that. Um, and so having good science can really create the political will uh, to act. And so science is a political motivator, at least from my perspective. Um, it can also be very critical, by the way, in dispelling myths. Uh, there, there are, there's mythology that develops around water when you're, when you're trying to solve problems out in the field. And, and there's all sorts of beliefs that develop around, oh, this country is doing this, these people are doing that. Our water is disappearing magically because of this and this. Science can help dispel that mythology. It can help level the playing field and create a common understanding of the issue, which is critically important to solving problems that I care about in the policy and diplomatic sphere. Um, and so that's, that's very, very, very critical. Um, unfortunately, it's easier said than done. Uh, you know, we've done a good job, I think, in the scientific community at signaling potential problems, uh, but we haven't done such a very good job at um, providing the evidence for intervention. And it isn't for a lack of trying. Uh, I think this is just a, really a sincere reflection of, of trying to dissect water's role um, from us often a very multifactorial problem. And, and it's just it's a very complicated space to work in. So when you're trying to say that, oh, a specific water intervention leads to these kinds of outcomes, it becomes incredibly complicated to do. But that's the kind of messaging that often policymakers want to see where they invest their money into these kinds of things like that. Uh, so we're still wrestling with some of that at the time. Um, the second point, uh, and science only gets you so far in the water world, right? I think you guys know that. Uh, water is you know, it's not a technical thing. Uh, and it's a social, it's a cultural thing. There's emotional connections to water that we very much struggle to define and to quantify. Uh, and so almost anything that we do in water, even if it's, uh, if it's hydrological predictions, if it's looking at the future, the uncertainties around water are always large. There's an inherent dynamism in water systems that, that mean whatever answer we have today is not going to be right tomorrow. Um, I love the quote that the only thing that's constant in water is change. Um, and as, as a policymaker, I actually like that ambiguity because it means that the solution space uh, is large enough to kind of capture disparate interests. That there, you know, that there isn't necessarily a right answer, but there's a solution that's right answer. Um, and as a policy, that, 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 that makes it a lot easier um, for me to try to solve what may be very complicated uh, political or social problems that, that exist in communities. Um, you know, I've lost every, every page. It is an example of change. It is exactly right. Well, and that's actually the point, which is um, how, do you, how do you begin to work in this complicated situation? We've got these large types of uncertainties. And actually, you know, if you're honest, if we do honest science, we appreciate the surpassing nature of what we're doing, the messy, the indeterminate results that we've got. But this, what this does is that this makes the face of behavioral change. You know, it, it makes the sense that it, it communicates very clearly that the solution, that the answer, 
answer is less important than the process of getting to the solution. Uh, and the process of getting to the solution uh, can be used to build trust, it can be used to build cooperation, it can strengthen the legitimacy of the science at the end of the day, it can reinforce the need, and this is really important for adaptive value. And at the end of the day, look, we, we want management teams for institutional arrangements that can readily adapt to the changing needs and issues that we have, uh, that can respond to the range of challenges across sectors, across stakeholders, uh, and across different sets of values. And, and so the lack of determinism in water science, in my view, while frustrating, uh, is an incredible policy strength. Uh, and it's a message we should actually embrace and, and, re and really push for because it allows us to engage uh, and develop collaborative relationships and constantly adapt and follow precedents into that relationship. Uh, so I would argue that the science is not just a motivator uh, of political will, but a facilitator of change. Um, and, and that's an important thing for me. Uh, so, you know, science, I think, has the benefit of, of telling us where, when, why, how we need to work to address these challenges. But at the same time, the process of science research, joint data collection, modeling, analysis, all the things that you guys work on, really forces us to think in new and creative ways, uh, which I think will build a greater appreciation for the complexity of water uh, and for the need for more holistic and, and adaptive solutions. And, and to me, that's the most important message uh, that policymakers can deliver on water right now. Um, and that's the need for flexible, robust, resilient solutions and legal arrangements and institutions uh, that can address our evolving needs in a rapidly changing hydrologic society. Thank you. That's great. I think you very eloquently described uh, water as not just a molecule, which is how many of us scientists may, may, may think of it, really the kind of medium uh, through which we convey uh, issues, uh, uh, cultural concepts, and uh, even uh, 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 values. Um, and, and we try to negotiate them through this, this uh, what uh, scientifically is a distinct molecule. Well, I think uh, IWR, IWRM is a verb. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good way to say it. Well, um, we'll uh, come back hopefully uh, with questions later. Uh, I'm going to turn now to uh, John Kuchar, uh, uh, another long, long time uh, colleague and friend. Uh, John is a senior uh, economist at the Hydrological Engineering Center in Davis, California. Uh, and, and he leads uh, several large RD projects that are associated with IWRM, presumably as a verb. Uh, 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 integrating climate adaptation uh, into uh, U.S. Army Corps engineering <coughs> processes. He serves as an advisor on a variety of large and, as he says, quite complex uh, Army Corps projects. He's also a co-author on our recent publication. John? Thanks. Uh, it's hard to follow the diplomat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I want to say it's an honor for me to be here. I want to thank Sarah for uh, inviting me. Uh, as I was thinking about this question, um, how can science inform water policy, I was reflecting on a couple of experiences that I had uh, several years ago, um, both one where I felt like science was relatively well integrated into the decision-making process, and one where I felt like science was really uh, devoid from the decision-making process. Um, and so the first one um, was uh, a project in Vietnam uh, that was being led by a set of local universities, NGOs, Sort of provincial level technocratic institutions there um, that was really built around trying to understand how a particular basin could better sort of balance uh, the needs for hydropower production, flood risk management, and urban development. Um, and the team that was there, uh, sort of led by these sort of researchers and scientists, I think did a really good job of developing what I thought was a very sort of um, well thought out proposal uh, for the decision maker. Um, and they presented that proposal to sort of a provincial level uh, political official um, with a lot of great sort of supporting facts and information. And um, uh, it was a very positive meeting. And a couple months later, we found out that nothing changed um, and sort of the status quo persisted. Um, and so in some ways at the time, that really felt like a rejection of science to me because we had laid out a lot of really great reasons why other considerations should have been sort of part of that process. Um, Later on, sort of reflecting back on that and thinking about it, uh, when the decision-making power rests in sort of a single individual's hand, um, it's challenging uh, because uh, any deviation from the status quo is something that they have to respect, they have to accept responsibility for. And so the safest, sort of best, most like self-preservation sort of 
instinctual option is really sometimes just to do nothing. Um, uh, on the other hand, in the core of engineers where I work, I feel like about 90% of our sort of decisions are very well supported by science. Um, uh, I was, uh, again, working on a sort of project uh, several years before the Vietnam project, uh, an ecosystem restoration project in California um, that involved spending um, uh, a couple million dollars on analysis, actually, in sort of many years of data collection and integrating that into decision making. And along that process, dozens, maybe hundreds of decisions were just made internally by the team with nothing more than sort of the information that we collected and the policy guidance that we had on how we should use that information. It wasn't until sort of very late in the process that we wanted a relatively minor deviation from the team's policy that we had to present our work in front of a decision-making panel. Um, and after, again, sort of a, uh, an acrimonious and somewhat political process, we received that deviation. But thinking back sort of on that and the amount of money that was being spent on that project and how little like I sort of knew, quote unquote, who the decision maker was in that case, uh, made me realize that actually in that particular case, the decision maker were all those documents, all that policy, all that guidance that said when you collect scientific information, this is the way that you use it, uh, which gives decision makers the freedom to turn a decision over to the people who understand those decisions the best, the scientists who understand the places that they're working, and the types of decisions that need to be made. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess those two experiences are sort of formative to me in sort of thinking about how it is that science can be better integrated into the decision making process. I think it's very important that it's in, inter, integrated into the process and not into some sort of individual. Um, I think there's a couple of things that really sort of have to take place in order to uh, integrate. Uh, science into, into decision-making, particularly around water policy. Uh, the first thing is, is that some sort of directive. There needs to be some sort of directive within the institution that says we're going to change and this is why we're going to do it. There needs to be some sort of guidance that puts that directive within the context of the organization and the context of sort of the general decision-making process. There need to be a set of tools, methods, and policies for sort of what I call non-believers, the people who didn't want to already sort of institutionalize that change. And then there needs some, to be some sort of cultural shift that allows that change to become routine. And that's, to me, really the pathway towards integrating science into sort of water policy. It has to be through formalization. Science is, in its very nature, a very sort of objective sort of science. And so getting in front of people and making subjective arguments is often not particularly productive, I feel like. Um, uh, I wanted to sort of just close with like one example that I think um, I have a colleague here, Roman Menley from uh, the Department of Water Resources, where we're working together uh, in, um, uh, in California DWR. And I was thinking about how uh, much a leader uh, the state of California is in integrating climate adaptation um, planning into their decision making process. So they sort of already have undertaken that uh, directive sort of approach uh, through executive order. And I had to get this from Roman. Um, but through Executive Order B3015 and Assembly Bill uh, 1482 and 2800, uh, which, both, uh, which told uh, all state agencies in California to consider climate change planning or to climate change in all planning and investment decisions. Um, so uh, uh, California DWR has been at hard work sort of trying to implement that directive internally as an agency, uh, both with some work that some of my colleagues here in the front row have been involved in. Uh, that's like written up in the California um, Fifth uh, Climate Change Assessment uh, and uh, the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan and several other pieces of documents. They've also been very proactive in sort of engaging the scientific community to fill in the gaps where they know that they don't quite understand how to institutionalize that change. Uh, so uh, Roman and his team, for instance, have um, uh, convened uh, this uh, group that they call the Floodmar Research Advisory Committee, which is a network of sort of dozens of researchers uh, in active areas of interest to the Department of Water Resources, places where they're not sure that they quite have sort of the data, the tools, and the methods to sort of institutionalize the directive that they've been given. Uh, and they're engaging researchers sort of actively trying to turn uh, scientific research into the sorts of guidance and tools and methods that are necessary to uh, make this part of a routine process. So those are my thoughts, and I'll turn back over to Paul. Thanks. That's great.
you also need an abstract of it and then think, think uh, about and trust in that process. That's especially important, I would think, uh, with such a new and emerging area as a climate adaptation where there's no international standards, there's no kind of clear, defined criteria that you're, that you're supposed to do A. Uh, there's no uh, standards organization. Uh, so you have to always feel your way forward with that process. So thank you. Um, uh, now I'm going to uh, turn to a very different uh, set of decision making uh, context with uh, uh, Yana Andranidu. <laughs> uh, she's affiliate faculty in the Department of Science and Technology uh, uh, Society at Virginia Tech, and uh, I think very interestingly, a founder of a nonprofit children's environmental health organization, Parents for Nontoxic Alternatives. Her work focuses on environmental health, policy, justice, at the intersection of scientists, engineers, and diverse public. So uh, I'm going to leave it to you to talk about the rest of your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah, and for inviting me here. And uh, it's really an honor to be in this room. I have been working on the problem of lead in drinking water for over 10 years now. Uh, this problem came to me. I did not go to it. I just happen to be one of thousands of Washington, D.C. residents and the mother of an infant at the time who was subjected to our city's historic flooding water crisis. D.C.'s crisis began in 2001, was covered up for two and a half years, and was finally made public in 2004. The contamination was unprecedented. Letting water levels flowing out of people's taps were far, far higher than Flint. Subsequent scientific studies showed that the crisis resulted in hundreds and possibly up to 42,000 cases of elevated blood lead levels in the city's children, as well as a 37% increase in fetal death. Today, I'm speaking to you as a mother, researcher, and activist. My message is this. First, that a science-based water policy means policy that is built purely on rigorously produced and carefully verified scientific facts, when it comes to lead in water, I have not yet seen science-based water policy. And second, that given the complex realities of real-world water problems, the ideal of science-based water policy may actually not be ideal at all. In fact, it may be dangerously reductionistic and may need to be reimagined. I'll explain with four vignettes. Vignette one, the EPA's lead and cover rule, or LCR, was enacted in 1991 to protect consumers from lead in drinking water. Unlike other drinking water regulations, the LCR is a shared responsibility rule. It renders water utilities responsible only for preventing large-scale and severe contamination, and it makes users responsible for protecting themselves at individual tasks. Despite this unique arrangement, the LCR invests no mechanism whatsoever for letting the public know that even when water utilities fulfill their part of the deal, meet regulatory requirements, and declare the water safe, users can experience both chronic and acute exposures to lead. These exposures can be frequent enough and high enough to cause miscarriage, stillbirth, and irreversible brain and neurological damage, especially in fetuses, infants, and young children who are the most vulnerable to harm. Vignette 2. Washington, D.C.'s lead in water contamination and the health harm it wreaks on individual children was discovered by distraught, unnamed, and unrecognized residents only months after the crisis began. Independent re independently, residents also discovered technical aspects of the contamination, like the fact that lead levels often increased while tasks were running, which contradicted the prevailing scientific understanding of the time and turned out to have significant implications for public health. Alarmed and desperate for help, between 60 and 80 affected residents in D.C. pleaded with our Department of Health to have their lead service lines replaced. These residents' pleas were dismissed by scientists at the water utility and policymakers at EPA, just like what happened 13 years later 
to the residents of Flint. Vignette 3. In 2014, EPA cherry-picked a work group of advisors for recommendations on how the LCR should be revised. Ten of the 15 work group members represented government agencies as well as water utilities and their professional associations. At least six were scientists or engineers, none of whom had any history calling for a stronger LCR. To the contrary, when my colleagues and I objected to the composition of the group and argued for the inclusion of people who had been affected by letting water and who were leading the fight for a more just regulation, we were told that residents only bring opinions. Work group members, on the other hand, were selected carefully to bring facts. Our protests continued, and eventually, I think EPA felt bullied by us into inviting me to the work group. I took advantage of the invitation. The day when I insisted that a revised LCR needed to finally shout from the rooftop that letting water can cause miscarriage and fetal death, I was pulled into a private room by a male engineer with no children of his own who shouted at me, red with anger, that I needed to drop my request or I was going to lose my credibility. In the end, convinced that the group's recommendations defied the science, did little to protect to empower people with the information that they need to protect themselves, and if adopted, would result in a weakened regulation I filed the group's sole dissenting opinion. Vignette 4. In 2016, Michigan's Governor Rick Snyder invited me to serve as advisor to the committee he created for solving Flint's water crisis. My main task was to help with the development of a Michigan specific LCR that would be the most stringent in the United States. Indeed, a new and improved, though not perfect, LCR was made into law six months ago. Yet two days ago, this week, this past Tuesday, a coalition of Michigan water utilities filed a lawsuit to kill parts of the regulation. One of the coalition's objections is the requirement of citizen advisory council, which would finally give affected Michigan residents a seat at the table where decisions are made. So what's the takeaway message? That the science-based water policy framework, when put into practice, may be limited and problematic. By implying that all we need for the creation of robust water policy is scientists who have the facts and policymakers who are thirsty for the facts, this ideal can not only contradict reality, but can inflict two forms of injustice as well. Procedural injustice. This is the normalization of the systemic exclusion from the decision-making process of the very people who are living with the problem that the policy aims to address. And testimonial injustice. This is the inherent assumption that the knowledge and values of affected individuals are irrelevant. Testimonial injustice is based on nothing more than identity prejudice. So as noble as the ideal of science-based water policy might be, I posit that in practice, it risks perpetuating a specific social order that we conflate with robust policymaking, when in actuality, it replicates the very injustices at the root of many of the water challenges that we face today. Behind the veil of science-based water policy, there are often beliefs and values that should give us pause because they undermine our capacity to address water challenges effectively. These beliefs and values often include that water challenges are separable from social inequalities, separable from histories of discrimination and neglect, separable from the collective trauma of living without access to safe water or living with physical ailments, fear, and grief, while simultaneously being silenced. These beliefs and values also include that water challenges can be addressed through policies that leave these inequalities intact, that leave these, leave these histories unchallenged, and that leave these traumas unhealed. The beliefs and values behind the ideal of science-based water policy also tend to mask that water science and policy 
almost invariably embed value judgments and scientific uncertainties and unknowns. But they're shown by individuals with power and with personal, professional, and institutional mindsets and interests. And can be created, strengthened, and even corrected by non-experts who live day in and day out with the problem at hand. In closing, I'd like to propose that the big water infrastructure systems of the 19th and 20th centuries are not only crumbling, but they also bring with them a mindset about people and water that is not serving us well. Aligning scientists and policymakers with effective communities for collaborative problem solving is a moral imperative because multidisciplinary and extradisciplinary thinking is a precondition to water policies that are technically robust, morally sound, and socially just. Thank you. So 
the question we often ask is, you know, what are we preparing for and how do we go about doing that? And there's lots of things we know about that we're preparing for now. There's lots of things we know about that we're not sure how to prepare for because we don't know how they're going to come to fruition. And we're not really experienced in them. And then there's all the things that we don't know that are going to happen, that are going to happen to us, that we want to be prepared for. They can't be prepared for them because we don't know what they are. We're still responsible for being prepared for them. So that's our context in our long range planning. So it's really a game of uncertainty, right? How do you prepare for things that are going to be changing? How do we um, grapple with these changes? How do we set ourselves up for success? So on one hand, we want to be making sure we're prepared for the long term. And on the other hand, we're decision makers, we're organizations who are responsible um, for making smart and responsible decisions, right? So we can't have over invested in our system. We can't have stranded assets because that's the political consequences associated with those are really significant. So how do you find this line, especially when you can't see the future? So it's really about um, my work is, is focused on embracing uncertainty, planning for multiple futures, and thinking about how could the world come together um, or come to fruition in a different way uh, than we are experiencing it today. So one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is snow, right? And snow is in the West. Snow is our primary source of water. So 80% of our water supply um, comes from snow, and that snow comes in the winter. So thinking about the future, we still anticipate getting some precipitation in the winter, but if, what if it doesn't come in the form of snow? Or what if we get more rain on our side? I mean, just some of us are skiers, you guys. We're serious business. <laughs> 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 Professional guys are from the recreational side as well, right? But what happens if our precipitation really starts to change? You know, snowpack is one of our, our, um, our, it's our cheapest reservoir. Right? But it's something that we also, also depend on. So if that goes away, how do our business practices and processes need to change? And just to, to take a quick tangent, because I know we have plenty of time. Um, I think that this, we have a, a we ought to encourage our, for ourselves to have a philosophical conversation of what we want our community to look like in the future. Do we want to maintain the environment that we have now? And if we do, what do we need to have a place to do that? Climate change is here and now. Climate change is water change. And that is everybody's business. But if we want to fish, if we want to ski, if we want to recreate, if we want to raft, that means we need to recreate what the natural environment has been doing in the past. But it's not going to continue to do that in the future. So that is a big conversation. We talk about no more storage, right? Well, in the West, the only reason we're surviving is because of and if we start to think about our ecosystem and the natural environment, this high elevation storage of snowpack, which is going away, if we want to maintain that, we have to be able to recreate that. That's a really hard conversation for us. That's a challenge. Um, so coming back around uncertainty planning, um, we're seeking ways to think about flexibility. And we've already talked about this. We have heard statements about this. But we want to build adaptive capacity. What does that mean in practice? And it means making investments that are scalable, so we can scale them up, we can scale them down. It means making investments that have co benefits. It also means thinking about investments that eventually could become stranded assets and having a backup plan for what they can be. Right? Um, it also means diversifying our portfolio, just like you would do in your own financial investments. Right? You don't want to throw all your eggs in one basket. You want to have geographic diversity, so we, if it's in the water, we want to have supply in the northern part of our system and the southern part of our system, not just in one location. And we also want to have invested in multiple types of assets. I right? use one water solution, that's critically important. I'm thinking about new supply, but also investing in efficiency and communication with our customers. Um, so a couple of scientific questions that I've been grappling with and thinking about that I wanted to request to the audience. I know we get to come back and talk about this next year, and I'm really hoping for um, solutions to mm -hmm. see me um, about this uh, in 2019. Number one, uh, this idea of a buffer. What? How do we? How do we figure out what type of buffer we need and why? So I work in supply, water resources, company, right? And I work in the West semi-arid region. So I'm thinking about drought. But we're also experiencing extreme floods, right? And extreme
same event. So if I build a reservoir, how much, how large do I want to make that reservoir? Where do I want to put that reservoir? But how much of a buffer do I need at the top of that reservoir to account for flooding conditions? Right? And what does that look like and why? So how do we look at these multiple objectives in making our decision? Um, and I'm also really interested in so sizing location of infrastructure. Right, but thinking about um, buffers in other ways as well. So how do we build buffers into our decision and into our operations? Um, but the next, um, the next point is uh, how do we pull the trigger on a decision? How do you, if you can, especially if you're making a decision that can only be invested in one, what size do you build to? Where do you locate it? Thinking of sea level rise and whatnot. Um, and when do you put that project in place? So we have been going through a permitting process since 2003. That is not shovel and dirt. That is moving paper, right? That is a long time. We haven't even started building or designing because we haven't gotten through a permitting process. So if it takes 25 to 30 years to put a project in place, you know, what do you need to have? In, what do you need to have in place to be able to trigger that decision to happen? And then how do you decide what that decision should look like? Um, finally, uh, I need to wrap up. I think it's really important for us to monitor social values. We did some focus groups a few years ago, and they were just fascinating. We learned that our customers don't want to harm others. When we put them in the context of how do you want to prepare for the future? Do we want to look at supply? Do we want to look at disease? Do we want to buy water from other sectors? Do we want to develop some supply projects? And in that whole conversation, we learned that people don't want to harm others. And others is everyone. It's the environment, it's their neighbors, it's other communities, it's other sectors. So our focus groups talk themselves into direct quotable reads. <laughs> in a matter of 35 minutes, you guys, that is unreal. So understanding social values is critically important. We need, to, we need to recognize that and then keep track of it over time. Finally, uh, responsibility. It's my responsibility to understand uh, the capabilities and limitations of science to be a smart user and consumer of science. And it's your responsibility to help me be a smart user and consumer of science, as well as thinking about the implications of using your science in practice. If your science is used to make a decision, you are also
David is, uh, I, I understand, uh, uh, from catching up with him before, that he's now in his second or third retirement. <laughs> um, he had a senior staff position on water, energy, and transportation committees in the U.S. House. Uh, in that position, he worked on legislation that directly affected administration's policy and federal agency actions, related uh, especially to uh, the U.S. Army Corps, uh, the Department of Interior, uh, EPA, Longo Power, Tennessee Valley, uh, and uh, DOE. Um, uh, what I, I have always been uh, impressed uh, with, uh, with David is that prior to coming he worked for over 20 years uh, for the new uh, Department of Interior, managing water science programs in the Colorado River Basin in the Grand Canyon. Uh, during his tenure at DOI, he was instrumental in formulating the adaptive management approach for other river systems impacted by dams uh, and river operations. It, 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 during an incredibly influential period uh, in how we think about uh, the Colorado River today. So, so David. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. And it's hard being in the suite after all these eloquent speakers are recording and they steal all your lines, so they will point. So I'm going to deviate a little bit from, from what I was going to say to try to reemphasize what I've heard throughout the panel. First off, I want to emphasize that I'm here also because I work for Elizabeth on the Water Science Technology Board on uh, national water issues. Uh, and I'm a 35-year member of the American Geophysical Union. So I've had a long history with the organization, and I too am so pleased to see so many young people in the audience because you really are the future, in my mind, of where and how we're going to take science and continually influence better public policy. Um, I sit at an interesting um, intersection right now in that I deal with policy, I deal with politics, I deal with science, I also deal with business. How to use science to make money in the sense of modeling, predictive capacity, etc. But I also deal with the structure of government. And as John alluded to, I spent some years on the Hill uh, working for various House of Representatives committees on, as a scientist, as an engineer, trying to help interpret science for members of Congress so that they can better understand how to, how to utilize that information for that decision. Framework. I'm also a student of, of water history. Right across the street, I don't know where it actually is here, the National Portrait Gallery. You never get a chance to go over. There's a beautiful portrait, unfortunately, not on display today, but of, of Major John Wesley Mill. For those of you who are any knowledge of the Western United States, John Wesley Powell was probably the first scientist who actually really had an impact on water policy in the Western United States. When I'm, I'm the director of the U.S. Geological Survey at a national president also, but he was the man who basically took the information from the trips in the Grand Canyon and throughout the Colorado Basin and said, we need to figure out a way to manage this basin. It's not like water is in the east where you've got a plethora of supply. We really have a very limited supply, so we have to figure out how to deal with it better. So we started to bring science into that process. I think that's really important because, A, we have a long history. Want to look back and of people trying to bring information in the decision framework. And if you want to take, I, I have lived in Durango, Colorado, and part of the year in Tucson, so we treasure our water in Colorado. So I appreciate all you're doing. Just keep your hands off the Western Slope. Western Slope. Because I want to be on too. And I want to vote on hand fish, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's and really, really important. But today I find it interesting. Yeah. When we're sitting here. There's a group of folks sitting out in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, debating over what's coming, coming in the very near term, a shortage call on the Colorado River. Probably not going to happen this year, but over a 60% chance it's going to happen in 2020. And what that does is it's going to set in motion a whole variety of actions that some were kind of prepared for, most we haven't. And not only do we have seven Colorado based states, but there's Aaron and I were chatting beforehand. We have a treaty with the Republic of Mexico that is delivering water to our southern neighbor, which is all fraught now in a variety of political maneuvers, mostly driven by tweets, but, um, <laughs> but that are equally important to this issue of how we manage a diminishing water supply. 2002, we, we entered a really interesting phase in Colorado. 
in 2002, we crossed the line of not having enough supply <coughs> all of our data. And so now the states have tried to squeeze more and more out of less and less. And the states, to be honest, have done a tremendous job. All of them have stepped up and started to look at how can we do better conservation? How can we be more efficient? How can we squeeze the sponge of, our, of the available water? The problem is, is that, as we just heard, over 80% of our water comes from snowpack. If snowpack isn't around that much anymore, how are we going to maintain what we have? We have a whole plumbing system, Peter knows this better probably than anybody, of dams in the western United States and Colorado Basin that were built under the premise that our biggest, snow, our biggest reservoir is the snowpack. And so most of these dams are not like Corps of Engineer dams that are flood control dams. They're, they're storage dams. They're not designed to be able to respond to a hugely different hydrology than we're now facing. Interesting. How do we reoperate these? Based on the laws that were written in the 1920s, the Colorado Compact. It's been updated a couple of times, but not to address this rising issue of climate change and how quickly, how fast it's changing in Colorado. I say that because as a student of the history of water policy in the United States, we have not had a national systematic, systematic review of national water policy since 1973. Just think about that. It's been since 1973 that we took a look as a nation at what our national water policy is. There's a couple of reasons we slipped away from that one. When, when Reagan came into office, he said, let's shift our, di our dialogue from federal government giving oversight and direction to the states. That was a political decision. They made it, and it, but it's held for them. And most of those decisions related to water is now vested in the states rather than in the federal government. The federal government still does do some ad hoc planning, if you want to call it that, through the water bill, the Water Resource Development Act bill, or through some of the other um, large-scale water bills that have been passed in the last few years. But it's not a systematic look at where we get it at. And that's really important that I think at some point, and I continue to advocate this with my colleagues on the Hill, that we need to resurrect this issue again to at least have a dialogue to find out if we as a nation are moving in the direction that we would like to. Um, in my role up on the, on the Hill, one of the things that I realized very quickly is the majority of time you just spend talking about issues. You spend a lot of time in meetings and uh, at nausea going around and around. But then there come these unique opportunities, windows of opportunities that open up where you can affect change. I would say Katrina was one of those. We affected change in how the Corps of Engineers does um, planning around levees and, and uh, maintaining flood issues. <coughs> it happened again with Hurricane Sandy, where we were able to then get, in, one, in that particular instance, get a coastal perspective that the Corps of Engineers began to look at coastal management from Maine to Norfolk and then the next border bill we put it from Norfolk, Virginia down to Florida. So we began to look at regional applications. So we had talked about that here. We didn't have a vehicle to move it forward. Sandy, we were able to move it forward. Senator Schumer was instrumental in making sure in that bill we included that particular issue. The last example I will give is the Mississippi River. In, in 2010 and 2011, one year, we were in severe drought. And the soybean farmers and the barge owners were coming into our office saying, you've got to get money to the court to blow off the rocks down around St. Louis so they can get the barges downstream. The very next year, it's flooding. And they say, you got to go in there and build more facilities along the river so we can tie up our barges and protect them from the flooding. So, in the stand, and I point to that because it shows the extreme variability that we're now starting to see in our hydrologic systems. And with that opportunity with the Mississippi River, again, allowed us to go work with, some, with the Corps and look at tiny switches that we could do. The thing to remember is most of our federal agencies have a long, long history. And you're not going to change it overnight. What you can do is look for these windows of opportunity. So, in just in summary, some of the challenges that I see facing us in our in integration of science and policy are kind of several fold here. One is that we need to continue to innovate, and we need to continually innovate not only our process, but the way we think about things. And that requires
is the ability to connect the dots to credit. So all of you scientists and training out there and soon to be professionals in the real world, it, we got to think outside the box. How we use our science to be more effective for policy. The second is that I think we need to continue to look at what's the value added side. It can be added to what you're doing maybe as individuals, but how it ties to other science. And I used the example just a couple of weeks ago, we were in another National Academy of Science building. We had a shared meeting with one of the climate boards, and we were talking about how to take water data and use it for climate. And to me, we started to make some really good connections there. Because in that meeting, there was business people, there were academics, there were folks who really used this information. And it's those connections, I think, are going to be so much more important in the future as we move forward. Water energy nexus, we've already heard several people refer to it, it's critical. Um, especially if you're looking at desal or you're looking at any of these high energy intensive ways to create more water. We can do it, but we got to do it with smart. We have to be smart about it as we move along. And then lastly, I think it's the climate and extreme weather impacts that we're facing today. We have not ever had to face the challenges of this variability that we're seeing today. And a good friend of mine, Dr. Polworthy from NOAA, and I were chatting about this at the Wilson Center a couple of weeks ago. And he was saying, we, we're now seeing our soil drying up so much faster than we've ever seen before. And that in itself, we hadn't thought about it. We just thought about it in drought and sort of flood. Now we're thinking about it in terms of what is the impact of that soil moisture. And what does that do to the crop? And how does that impact how farmers and agricultural folks and economies make decisions related to that? I just came back from China where we were meeting with a bunch of folks over there looking at some of the very same conditions. How to manage large river systems that are, in their case, uh, maintained by glaciers. Glaciers are going away. So now, what's going to happen to society that has been built around this? The last point I want to make is that we've made a huge investment in this country and in every country in the nation and in the globe um, in our water infrastructure. This infrastructure now is aging. And we are at a point where we're going to have another one of those windows moved where I think we can look at how the plumbing system that maintains water supply is changing and whether we have the right infrastructure in place. This is the engineering we talk. Whether we have the right infrastructure in place to manage the water system, the plumbing system in the new world, or whether this is that opportunity where we either refine and revise and build our infrastructure more efficient, or in some cases, we may take it away. Karen and I were talking earlier in Japan. They're looking at now at removing some of their high tributary dams, Sabu dams, in order to move sediment into systems and move it off to the coastline, etc. We need to be thinking outside the box. So, again, I just want to say, I think I love Karen's term of science can help dispel the mythology. So, what I do today in this particular chapter of life. Interpret science for people who work on that dome building up on the hill. Um, we all love to be scientists. We all love to be able to use a lot of acronyms and such. We have to learn how to interpret the science. And put it in, the, in, the, in front of the decision makers and policy makers and show how it is relevant to what they're doing. We can't expect them to make that jump from um, the science paper and the acronym in good public policy. Unless we're willing, as students of science and as people who work with science, to help make that transition.
that we, you know, we need to make sure that we are, we have signed it and take people, we are informing uh, the resolution of significant uh, social uh, uh, and, and environmental issues. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, how much time do we have? We have two minutes. Excellent. That's great. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, so how, and we, we can use all that for questions. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, let's, let's open it up. Uh, uh, so, we have a two, two microphones. Um, and uh, we, we need to make sure that we, we are talking into the microphones for those uh, uh, who are here. We can borrow some uh, for those that may be in the front. Um, and, if, and when you uh, when you speak, if you could say your, your name, your institution, um, uh, as, as well. All right. Yes, Hi, I'm Robin Lewis. I am an environmental justice activist and consultant in Maryland. So, Dr. Yana, I appreciate what you said um, because I struggle so hard to bring the science to the community so the community can be engaged. Um, in particular, um, working on issues such as lead as well as the um, input of fluoride into our system and science that has just recently been published about it and its, and its impact on low-income communities and communities of color. So I, I totally agree that science needs to be the foundation of our decisions, but I also believe that communities are not, you know, to be forced, these things are not to be forced upon the community. Communities should be engaged um, in all decisions that impact their health because we are the ones who are drinking it and a paternalistic view that, you know, they, they don't know because they're just giving their opinion is totally wrong and it's against the environmental justice principles. So I was going to ask the panel and others how they feel about including the community and the decisions and passing on scientific information to the community to let them decide what they are exposed to. Thank you. It's an excellent question. Uh, I, I think often uh, in this side of scientists, we, uh, we're, we're thinking about uh, maybe we know best and uh, when actually we, we are not the decider. Uh, and that's where probably it's um, uh, Yana, I'm, I'm, I can give you like to say something. Are there other things like that? Great, maybe. All right, Yana, why don't you go first? Well, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Use the mic. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I really do agree. Should I go? You know, in my experience with policy making is that we, we, on the lead and water side, we really haven't had a whole lot of success, um, as you were saying, John, earlier too, in putting out the facts in front of policymakers and seeing action. And the times when we have seen policy action has been when policymakers have seen that there are mobilized publics out there pushing for action. Um, and that there are scientists supporting these mobilized publics, and that there are reporters watching very closely uh, these mobilized publics. These are the times when we have seen movement in the policy world. Um, I will just, and I would just add to this that I, I can't speak directly to your question about the East Coast folks, and, but I support a lot with Native American tribes in the West with communities, the colonias that are along the Mexican border. And we have a tremendous number of what I would call disenfranchised communities who are not engaged or not encouraged to even engage in the dialogue. And I think one of the most poignant ways that I've learned this, and unfortunately it was the hard way, but it was a really important lesson, is that we were making policy changes on the way the Colorado River was going to be operated. And I had to figure out how to translate that to a group of Hopi elders in the Kiva and try to get them to support. Because we had asked them to be participants. They have, there are eight tribes that have social identity in the Grand Canyon. And to get them engaged, I felt it was really important that we brought them into the debate. But having to interpret science to a level that somebody who, if they graduated from high school, is a stretch. But I think it's critically important because they live there. They are the community. It's their hogans and their um, kivas that are out there that are being impacted, whether it's health, whether it's water 
supply, whether it's uh, grazing issues, we just have to do, I think that's our job as scientists to help get them out. All right. I Hello everyone, um, thanks for the, the wonderful talk, it's a really great presentation. Um, and the mention of John Wesley Powell, I think uh, he's such a, a wonderful um, and interesting fellow. Um, among other things, he was a uh, member of the first recorded event of long feet, which he did with uh, only one functional arm, the other was injured in the Civil War, shot off. Shot off. Yeah, Even more, more. Anymore, I think, <laughs> on that time he brought his mic. And so Emma Powell was also part of the first event. Um, and he was a national leader and showed national leadership in terms of water. Um, David, you mentioned the, um, really the, the maybe the end of a unified national leadership on water with the zero budgeting of the Water Resources Council in 1981 of the Reagan administration, which my understanding still remains a line item in the U.S. budget, but just with no allocation. Um, and I wonder, the question is, do we need more national leadership? Is there appetite for national leadership? And the specific part of that question is that, Lorna mentioned that, that uh, the Wilkie utilities serve one out of seven Americans. And the Wilkie utilities are um, embracing climate change and preparing for climate change. But every other utility I've spoken to really doesn't have the time to do that. And their planning process is so short uh, that they're more worried about pipes bursting next week. Uh, than, than the running out of water 30 or 40 years into the future. So six out of seven Americans are served by a water utility that is not uh, preparing for climate change or thinking about climate change. We've heard about the issues they face in terms of uh, crumbling infrastructure or whatever the case may be. Um, my sense is they need support. In the National Climate Assessment Water Chapter, we weren't allowed to say should, um, but it seems to me that there's that there are challenges for our water utilities. They, they are um, struggling with day-to-day -day issues. And who's going to support them in the, in the methodologies and the resources to plan for the future? So any thoughts on from the audience as well on that? Um, first, off, first off, you're right on. I mean, absolutely. We need, in my opinion, we need national and regional and state leadership. It has to all come together. And it, unfortunately, it takes readership to do that. And somebody or some entities that are willing to go outside the box to stimulate that sort of discussion. Um, it's critical. We're trying to work with this new Congress coming in to see if we, where we can identify the water leaders. Um, got several ideas that's been suggested to them on how we might manifest that. But I think what's equally critical it's the role that these scientific organizations like AGU play. It's the role that the National Academy of Science can play, and all the other ones that are out there, to start the dialogue between yourselves on how you can leverage the knowledge that you have and the information to help target and work with folks on the hill so that they get a consistent message. I'm working a lot with, there's 54 water resource centers funded essentially by the U.S., partly by the USGS, that exists in our universities around in territories around the United States. Um, they haven't been reauthorized. Now, where, if you think about that, where is the next generation of our water leaders going to come from? Obviously, academia is doing a bunch of things, but the water resource centers have always been that entity on campuses that bring in young people. And I like the fact that I had the Congressional Research Service do a study on this. For every federal dollar, for every one dollar we invest in WRRT, we get this we can leverage at 17 times. So think about that. What a great payback to the American public if they knew that. Unfortunately, several folks on the Hill tend to think that science that's done on water sometimes is what they define as oh, it's esoteric science. We gotta get over that. We gotta make sure that we get the message out. And I think that's the role that a lot of our scientific organizations can play is to help you every time you're in town, go to the hill, go to your member, talk to them, make sure they're educated on the importance of your science. Um, I, I like I want to thank you for you guys all, Casey, Yana, um, you, David, and the woman who spoke before for giving a voice to something that's been troubling to me. Um, as somebody who works in the Corps of Engineers for a number of years, which is that uh, everything that we do now is cautious. 
um, by local communities. And this may have a positive benefit of like getting buy-in from the community, but it also has a very real negative benefit, which is that the people who come to us asking for solutions to problems are the people who can afford to pay. Um, and uh, and I, I don't know what the solution to that is. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to know that people like you are working on it. Uh, but I think that that's a, a very real concern for sort of the, the health of our national water resources. Uh, please. Hi, uh, my name is Wendy Wilson. I'm with uh, the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. Um, so it's a group that represents the state primacy agencies. Um, and I just wanted to thank, well, all of you for, for great presentations, but David, I love the point that you made about um, using the current opportunity uh, to maybe course correct a little bit, and, and the fact that uh, EPA estimates we have a half a billion dollar need in the industry, AWWA, a trillion dollar need in terms of infrastructure, uh, replacement and renewal over the next, what, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and so through that, we're gonna see an enormous replacement of assets, and how do we use that opportunity to um, address future needs? I guess my question is kind of who do you see as the responsible party for that? I mean, is it truly just the utilities? What role do states and, and feds play in that? And then uh, if it is the utilities, how do we make that happen when we're looking at 150,000 water utilities? Most of them don't have the data they need right now to operate. How are they going to plan for the future? And, and use that opportunity of replacement to actually uh, bring some good to the community in, in terms of thinking ahead and strategically. <laughs> Please solve all my problems right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I think this, I, I really do like this point as well, right? On the infrastructure and using it as an opportunity to course correct and, you know, how do we change, how do we do, how do we, how do we make a difference? And how do we support 150,000 organizations across the United States to also do that? You know, and it's, I mean, fundamentally, where does the money come from? You know, how are we going to fund them? Um, I, I mean, I really struggle with, with how to answer this question, you know, because we want to provide leadership so that utilities like Denver Water and others can make a difference and make changes. We also want to set up um, the practice, so it's just expected that others are going to follow in the footsteps, right? So using this idea of you know peer-to-peer -peer networks, but peer pressure to institutionalize change is something that we've been grappling with. Um, but I think fundamentally, a lot of our support is going to come, and a lot of the change is going to come from the local level. Like I don't think we should necessarily be waiting for our national and sometimes even state support to have that make change happen and to make movement on it. I think we need to set ourselves up for being able to do the changes we need to do ourselves. Um, and that's not super optimistic, but I also feel like uh, because we need to do this, we're going to step up and make it happen. I mean, we provide this fundamental resource that's expected across our communities, the water is not going to go away. It's not like a cell phone where you can say, okay, well, this is the I'm just not going to do cell phone. It's <laughs> um, not going anywhere. You know, so it's expected in um, public health resources. But I think we're going to get there, but it's going to be slow. I'll have one more comment to that. We talked about the aging infrastructure, and we think it's steel and concrete, et cetera. There's another aging infrastructure that's out there. Peter, you were just on a panel, and we just had somebody from the GS talk to us a few weeks ago. The average age of a U.S. GS employee now is like 57. Think about that. All you young people out there, we are going to be losing our capacity, our natural knowledge capacity. You are going to be in a tremendous, if you want to work for the federal government and the U.S. GS, we need expertise if we're going to do this better in the future. And to me, so it's not only the steel and concrete that we're losing. We're losing, we're losing institutional knowledge that has to be brought along with the next generation. Thank you. So Peter Goodwin with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And I'd also like to congratulate the panel. I think you did a pretty good job coordinating and highlighting the main challenge. 
Uh, my question is, you've highlighted the problem of aging infrastructure, and much of that infrastructure is developed at a time when it's extremely objective. And now we've had social justice, sport equality, ecosystem recovery. Things are much more complicated, and you can't do a single project in isolation of everything else that's going on in the system. And so I think we in the science community were faced with this challenge that science could not respond on the same time frame that these decisions that you describe need to be taken. So my question is, is when is good science good enough on which to make decisions? Maybe to make decisions. <laughs> Right? I mean, if you have to make a decision, there's science you've got, and the way that you have to make a decision is the science you've got. Um, I mean, ideally, you know, again, this is why the focus needs to be on the process. Uh, you want a process that's rooted in science, that's inclusive, that engages all the stakeholders, as Ruby mentioned, uh, because it's that process that you're going to fall back on to ensure sustainability, resiliency, adaptability as you move forward. And you evolve your solution over time. I think one of the things we never talk about uh, when we talk about solutions to problems is not we were talking about this, but frequently like opportunity costs. Um, what decisions are you making that are going to lock your future in? They're going to, going to create social, economic, or environmental costs in the future uh, that it is going to lock you in development pathways that you don't want to be. Maintaining flexibility is, is primary. And so it, that's going to be key. If you don't have good science, and go ahead and develop a solution that can give you continued flexibility as you adapt and evolve as you move forward. It's got to be more than just good science, it's got to be the right science. And that's too. Well, thanks. I'm not even sure it's the right science. I'm worried about good science too. And what is good science? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, thank you for your question, and, and I'm thinking that you know sometimes we can talk about science as a monolithic system of knowledge, and um, I think that in the drinking water world, at least, that there seem to be um, you know different expertise and different camps of thinkers. Um, some who very much still promote the you know single vision, um, you know Victorian era. Uh, water systems uh, uh, from the late 1900s and early, um, I'm sorry, late 1800s, early 1900s. And then I think there's also the whole universe of scientists and engineers who are thinking big and creatively about, you know, centralized and distributed and decentralized systems and thinking very creatively um, about water management, water use, um, and in integrated um, ways. So. I, I, I do think that there is room here, and especially in a room with young generation scientists and engineers, um, the room to push forward and at the very front, um, the new thinking. And I think this is a window of opportunity for a paradigm shift. I think it's needed very desperately. Right. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up. Is that right? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. I'll, I'll be very brief. So I'm going to put my academic hat on because uh, first off, thanks to the panel for incredibly enlightening discussions. One thing that was said that but I'll put my academic hat back on. Um, it, what we see in academia now is, is, a, is a geometric explosion in the publications. We publish every year. We publish twice as much as we published the year before. And, and in reality, most of us are not reading that literature. Uh, and that's true. And so to the young people in the audience, something that Lorna said, which is own your work, be responsible. And I, I just I just put this out to all the young academics and faculty here in the in the room. If you're going to go in academia and write papers, own that work. Make it socially relevant and socially responsible. Try to get it out there to people. Because there's so much of it that it won't be read. So you have to take ownership to make it read and make it social you know, important to people. That's all. A great uh, commentary. So, uh, uh, right. So I'm going to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> and then, that's right. The last, last statement uh, will come from Ethan. I, 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 I was asked to summarize uh, and possibly uh, some, of, some of these comments. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I've been struck by, uh, back to 
my old publishing days, uh, I could always tell uh, when I was talking to an author if, they were, if we would have a successful project together. They had a really clear idea about who their audience was. And, uh, and, and you don't just develop a, an instant sense of who your audience is. You actually have to earn your audience. Uh, you have to really know and empathize with you. You have to have a, a, a little person in your head that you're actually writing for. And I would argue that that, that is a lot of what we're trying to do uh, when we, when we uh, are being useful uh, with the science in, in the policy, to have uh, to, to essentially develop a relationship uh, uh, through empathy, through identification, um, uh, to have a clear sense of, of that audience. And it, it's not it's not the publication. It actually is the conversation. I uh, was speaking uh, in Maryland at a uh, uh, an NSF center in Annapolis uh, in June. And it was a really smart ecologist. I read a lot of the papers that were sitting uh, it, uh, in front of me. And I was presenting some of the work we had done with a, a, some of the collaborators that are here, uh, 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 where we tried to uh, re reconcile differences between ecologists and engineers in the context of water management. And he, he said, how did you know uh, what the decision makers wanted? How, how, how did you get an idea of that? And I said, you're not that hard to find, me, I'm sure. You know, you, you, you can email them, you can call them, you can go see them, and they actually, for the most part, they want to see you. They actually often, uh, they have questions themselves uh, that they need to have answered, and they want that relationship, uh, that, that conversation. So that's a problem I think, actually. So uh, I think being able to, to reach out is, is a much lower obstacle than you think it is. And, and that's how we go from information to insight. All right, so uh, for that, I'll hand off to Ethan. Okay, so thanks. And uh, as much as I say, so we do have a time frame we need to keep. Uh, but before I make two quick announcements, let's thank our moderator and our panelists again. <laughs> Uh, we can continue the conversation in an informal way that's uh, reception earlier. However, this might give me a, uh, a sharp deadline, 6 p.m. We need to clean out the room. So I will make a quick announcement around like 5, 4, uh, 55, so we can grab your food and maybe sit outside of the building and continue the conversation. It's not like for today, actually. The second one is, I think Scott also mentioned this, we were, we, uh, as a uh, chair of the Water and Society Committee under ATU uh, hydrology sections, we do plan this as a two-year event. So next year, we want to coordinate with the AGU uh, Centennial Celebrations. We want to, um, actually, we are uh, collecting the idea what's the follow-up uh, event that we can do in the um, in San Francisco. So um, if you are having any idea or you want to know any follow-up of this uh, Water and Society Dialogue, please come to me or Sarah over there or uh, give, you, uh, give us your business card or your contact information. We will keep updates, we will let you know, and we will include you in our uh, discussion for next year's event. Okay? Thanks everyone for coming. Let's continue the conversation. Thank you.